it's another one of these situations where you know I think that we need to um, it's very easy to kind of um, take an extreme position and kind of say well you know, we should do it all natural or kind of go the other way and say you know the future is kind of biohacking everything and uh, becoming kind of you know, transhuman um, when actually I think that you know the reality I think that the challenge is, is how do we kind of navigate and, and try and take the best from these different approaches and and take a more kind of thoughtful, seasonal approach to life and work that's more sustainable, that actually helps us to try and take some of the benefits from these different approaches and, and also maybe mitigate some of the potential downsides as well. Happy start of the week, everyone. This is Jeff. Welcome to this week's episode of the HVMN podcast. Our guest this week is James Hewitt. He is the head of science and innovation at Hinsta Performance and a researcher at Loughborough University. His work and research focuses on holistic well-being of knowledge workers, and he specifically is searching for methods to sustain acute cognitive performance without compromising health in the process. He consults for a variety of clients, including Formula One, Fortune 500, C-suite executives, and he was also previously a professional cyclist. We discuss a number of practical topics you can apply to your life, including approaching knowledge work as an endurance sport for your mind, the challenges of research studies on cognition, and how to interpret cognitive performance data, and the impact of technology on learning and attention span. If you're tuning in via audio, remember to hit that subscribe button for weekly episodes. For folks on YouTube, please subscribe and hit that bell to enable post notifications. Without further ado, let's get right to it. Hey, James, thanks for being on the program. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. So uh, you have an interesting background, and I think cut from a similar cloth from folks in the HVMN community, where you come from a sports physiology exercise background, and also have a foot in practicization and, and and making the academia work into something tangible. Um, curious to zoom back, you know, to the beginning. You know, how did you get interested in in this whole field of improving human performance? You know, it's actually almost exactly uh, 15 years ago that um, uh, maybe even a bit more, actually, I, I moved to France to um, to pursue a career as a professional cyclist. Okay. Uh, I was uh, basically at the age of 19, um, I decided that I wanted to, to try my luck. Um, and so I, uh, I moved to France. At that time, there wasn't a lot of uh, structure in the United Kingdom uh, where I'm from in terms of helping road cyclists develop their careers. The thing to do was still to pack your bags and, and move to the continent. Mm. So I moved to moved to France. Um, I was riding for a regional amateur team, and then uh, gradually my career progressed. I, I ended up riding for quite a good um, uh, elite under twenty three team, uh, and that was linked with one of the professional teams. So you know we were all kind of told we'd have a shot at, uh, at superstardom if we were good enough. But um, the I made a decision that basically if um, if I reached the end of my under twenty three career. And I wasn't realistically knocking on the door of a, of a good a good professional contract, then I'd go back to university. And while well, I got to ride full time for three years, uh, for three seasons, once I got to that final year as an under 23, I had to be honest. And, and I knew that you know, I really didn't have quite what it took to get to the top of that sport. So, But during that time, one of the interesting things that happened is that it really cultivated my passion for measuring and improving human performance. And uh, I was a very early adopter of technologies like power meters, for example, because I wasn't the most naturally talented athlete. So I knew that I needed to think really carefully about putting my effort in the right place at the right time, uh, quantifying my training, uh, quantifying the, the racing where I could to really try and get the most out of my physiology and, and get the best adaptation. And, and I realized along the way that, that other people were interested in this kind of knowledge and I wanted to build on it. So I returned to the UK. I studied sports science um, at an institution called Loughborough University. And, um, and then uh, eventually I set up my own coaching business. And now, you know, a few of the people that I worked with were elite and, and professional endurance athletes, particularly cyclists. But actually, uh, the people who paid the bills were amateur cyclists. Hmm. You know, they were people who had very demanding jobs. Uh, in London, near to where I was based at the time. So they were finance professionals and they were architects and they were solicitors. And for whatever reason, outside of those incredibly demanding jobs and those 14, 16 hour work days, they decided that they wanted to 
race a hundred mile bike bike races and do Ironman triathlons as well. Reminds me a lot of folks in Silicon Valley who are, you know, they're execs and they're into their Ironman. It's definitely like a set of personality. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and they were my kind of core clients and I loved working with them, but, but there's a challenge. And that challenge was, was that the, uh, their work day was a black box. And I started to become intrigued by what was going on during their work day, because I could see in their training data and the other you know, the variables that I was measuring that what was going on in the workday was having a significant effect. Mm. Really, it was exerting a load, which I couldn't really account for, except for uh, in the outcome on their training, you know, the bad days. In which biomarkers were you measuring at the time or are still measuring? It was quite simple, really. I mean, I'm one of the things that I actually think is the most important to monitor is, um, is the rating of perceived exertion for okay. a session. You know, actually, the great thing about rating perceived exertion is that it integrates so many different signals from your body and um, yeah. from your brain. It, it represents kind of what, how you feel. And, right. and actually, there's a really strong relationship between rating of perceived exertion and, uh, and actually our endurance performance, how long we can sustain a, a, an effort for. And one of the things that I'd see um, straight away was that um, actually what was going on in the work day was having a very significant effect on how hard people felt the sessions were. And, and it's very intuitive, you know, had a bad day at work, suddenly the interval session is harder. But I'd also start to see even kind of changes in, uh, in their, their power output, how long they could sustain efforts for, um, the, um, the rate of recovery in between intervals, for example. You see a significant effect on, on sleep in terms of sleep and sleep disruption. You know, at that time, uh, we were just starting to get into kind of some wearable, some more wearable measurements, and which wasn't perfect, but you know, it was accurate enough for them. I could see change in an individual and direction. Right. You get some directional data at least. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And and so I started to say, you know, I've got to try and understand what is going on during this work day better. And I need to try and quantify it. And and so I started to apply tools and frameworks from sports science to try and understand knowledge work better. So the kind of work they're doing, you know, they were they were cognitive endurance athletes in many ways. And, and I started to try and understand it. And, and during that time, uh, I, I basically had a revelation. And, and my revelation was that knowledge work fundamentally is a cognitive endurance activity. And I could apply many tools, frameworks, principles to try and both understand knowledge work, but also look at how people could integrate their physical work and their knowledge work better, but also maybe even distribute cognitive effort better. And that's inspired a lot of my work and research that I do today. And I'm actually still an academic researcher. I'm actually finishing my PhD. Um, you know, finishing is, is a is a very relative term, isn't it? But I'm doing my PhD at, yeah. um, at Loughborough University still. Um, it's been ranked the number one university in the world for sports science. So I, I dropped that in there. Um, and um, exploring specifically knowledge work as a cognitive endurance activity and, and gathering data among some of the world's highest performing companies to try and build a better picture about what's going on. It's refreshing to hear because we've been you know, in Sconce and Silicon Valley. And that's a lot, a very similar analogy that uh, I make as well, where if you're the number one, you know, if you're the number one company in ride sharing or social networks, the value that you create and capture is exponentially larger than the number two, number three player. So in, just like in sport where a couple milliseconds or a couple meters, the difference between a gold medal and a silver bronze medal, the very similar dynamic, if not a more extreme dynamic, happens in the intellectual battlefield. Um, and it's always been puzzling to me that um, professional athletes, you know, the folks that we work with, uh, and I'm sure that you work with as well, they're very, very thoughtful and dialed in around their protocols or training, uh, measuring their recovery, fatigue, and load. And for intellectual workers, at least, you know, not a lot of my friends coming out of the Stanford Computer Science Program, their protocols are very haphazard, kind of like the stereotypical uh, pull an all-nighter, jam for 22 hours straight, crash for another 16 hours, and just do this haphazard uh, routine while chugging a bunch of sugary caffeine water. Um, and, and and I think clearly uh, one can extract and just deliver much higher quality work if they were a little bit more thoughtful about the routines. Um, mm. And I think on the, on the other side, I think we had a recent conversation with Alex Hutchinson, uh, who's author of Endure, who, uh, you know, I, I think his recent book, that was like a New York Times bestseller, but I think it really covered a lot of the, uh, I think, notions that you're investigating with Tim Noakes's and Samuel Marcour's work around how cognitive fatigue or mm. perceived exertion is like one of the dominant factors that predicts, you know, performance, which implies that the brain is such an important function of how one 
or, or the exertion, the, the perception of exertion is such an important factor of how one ultimately performs. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, it's, so some of the data that I've been gathering, and obviously it, it's preliminary, but I'm looking um, in particular at um, uh, cognitive performance, so I'm measuring cognitive performance twice a day uh, using a smartphone based cognitive testing app. Mm. And, uh, and then I'm also simultaneously measuring self report measures of things like stress and mood using validated scales. And, uh, and then objective measurements of, of sleep as well, for example, uh, including a number of other variables. But you're already starting to see some really interesting relationships in that data. And a lot of it's quite intuitive. But, you know, I think that everyone thinks that they're the exception, don't they? And, uh, you know, we all like to think that we accept with the exception to the rule, um, uh, particularly when it comes to, you know, to sleep deprivation and yeah. inadequate sleep. And, you know, there's this great kind of stat that I can roll out over and over again, which, um, you know, I'm sure that um, many of your, <laughs> some of your um, uh, guests have shared before, but after 18 hours of wakefulness, so that's equivalent to working from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m., yeah. your performance is equivalent to being legally drunk. And, uh, you know, someone came back to me once and they said, well, you know, there's some studies that suggest that kind of a moderate dose of alcohol can actually improve productivity. <laughs> and I'm saying, yeah, it, you're way beyond that. You know, you're legally drunk in most European countries um, after 18 hours of wakefulness. And and they did a really other interesting study. It was back in 2004, I think, by a research group um, uh, by uh, led by someone called Van Dongen. And basically, they uh, restricted sleep for this group in a number of different conditions. And uh, they restricted sleep for, for one unfortunate group entirely. So they went uh, without sleep entirely for, for one night. Another group, they restricted it for four hours. Another group, six hours. Another group, eight hours, which wasn't really a restriction. But they controlled those conditions for, for a two-week period. And then they monitored their cognitive performance using something called uh, psychomotor vigilance task. Hmm. And in particular, they looked for lapses of alertness and working memory. And so what they found was, as you'd expect, you know, for the group whose sleep was uh, restricted entirely for one night, that their lapses in their alertness and working memory shot right up. Uh, the group who slept for eight hours a night were fine. But then the group that slept for six hours, after 14 nights of sleep restriction to six hours, their performance in terms of that uh, lapses in alertness and working memory was equivalent to going without sleep for an entire night. Now, a lot of people, they listen to that and say, wow, that's, that's interesting. But, but actually, the, the second part of the study was more interesting for me. And that's because they also um, got people to do something called a Stanford sleepiness scale, uh, uh, your local sleepiness scale. And, uh, and basically, um, what they found was that, as you'd expect, the group whose sleep was restricted entirely for one night, um, their, their self-rated sleepiness leapt right up really quickly. Um, the group which slept for eight hours per night, their self-rated sleepiness was, was pretty static. They were getting adequate sleep. Um, but most interesting to me was that the group that slept only six hours per night, mm -hmm. initially their sleepiness kind of increased a little bit, but then it tapered off. So essentially after 14 days, after 14 nights of really inadequate sleep, their performance was equivalent to going like they had, they'd done an all-nighter, but they felt like they were fine. And this is the interesting kind of you know, tension when we talk about things like perceived exertion and our own perception is that it is really important, but at the same time, um, we can trick ourselves so easily. And when it comes to sleep in particular, I think a lot of us are fooling ourselves and uh, we think we're fine and we're probably performing like we're drunk. Stabilize it. That's an interesting result. We should definitely have that paper linked in the show notes because I think a lot of people uh, become, they, they, yeah, I think a lot of people feel like they, they, they'll claim, yeah, I feel good on six hours. And mm -hmm. I think you're, this, this piece of literature perhaps suggests that they've, they've tricked themselves. I mean, yeah. uh, which, is, which is funny. <laughs> We're good. You know, sometimes I think you can use it. Um, you know, the, I mean, if anyone's interested, that paper is called uh, uh, The Cumulative Cost of Additional Wakefulness. Yeah. Uh, so you can add it in the show notes. But, but it, there is this cumulative cost. It was a really great title. It, it summed it up really well. But there's also some interesting studies around sleep and cognition um, that suggest that um, our perception of how much deep sleep we have in terms of what we're told um, actually has an influence on our cognitive performance. And actually, um, if we're told that we have more deep sleep or less sleep, um, that it essentially induces a placebo effect uh, mm -hmm. for good or for bad. And so one of the things that I sometimes do myself and also recommend to other people, especially you know me and many of the people that I can hang around with are very keen self-quantifiers uh, to greater or lesser degrees, um, is that actually in certain conditions where you can't influence your sleep, then it's actually better not to record it. 
because actually once you've got this data and you know how bad performance it can be when your sleep is impaired, um, then it can just become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you know SIBO yourself. Exactly. Huh. So there's a lot of complexity here, which is kind of what makes it interesting. Yeah. So I think one of the interesting aspects for cognitive measurement is how applicable are some of these uh, reaction time, uh, you know, little experiments really applicable to broader uh intelligence. I'm curious mm. to get the latest thoughts and literature there. Um, what measures in terms of, you know, psycho, uh, psychomotor vigilance tests or um, inspection time, reaction time, what do you think are the most applicable to, it, or, or most associated with like broader intellectual function? It's a really good question. And it's one that I kind of uh, ask myself um, regularly, because a lot of the tests that I'm doing are based on quite basic cognitive tests you know they um uh, i'm not kind of um, uh, measuring kind of uh, real world work performance i'm measuring things like simple reaction time right. uh, procedural reaction time but um one of the tests in particular that i use measures inhibitory control it, there's a very plausible relationship between inhibitory control with, and downstream effects that affect real world performance so there's some suggestions that diminished inhibitory control might cause an increased uh, reliance on biases and heuristics for example because uh, there's a suggestion that inhibitory control, you know, essentially it's our, uh, our ability to um, resist what's called a preponent response. So that instant reaction. Um, right. you know, so um, we, we might talk about uh, system one and system two as, as Kahneman uh, popularized in thinking fast and slow. And so you can think about inhibitory control, but basically it's, it's the thing that you know, for a moment puts the brakes on system one, that instant reaction, and, and can help you think about the bigger picture. And it can maybe help you to not rely on that bias or that heuristic or that stereotype and, and gather a little bit more information uh, to make a better decision. And as knowledge workers, you know, that is absolutely key, you know, whether it's kind of uh, problem solving or decision making or even interactions in the context of a team. So I think there's a really plausible relationship there. And, and I've seen some quite significant effects um, on um, inhibitory control that uh, seem to be strongly associated with things like um, with sleep, but also also with mood. And I'm writing up some of those those papers at the moment, actually. And, but 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 you write that you know they, these are blunt instruments, and um, and actually you know I'm looking at other measurement tools. I'm looking at things like EEG, for example, to try and get um, more sensitive measures of what's going on. I'm experimenting with some EEG measurements at the moment, and uh, uh, I'm working uh, with a company. Uh, called Emotive, um, who who um, produce a, a number of uh, neuroinformatic technologies. Yeah. I'm convinced that probably not that long, I'm going to look back on the research I'm doing now. I'm going to say, wow, you know, my, my instruments were so blunt. Um, but it's kind of the best we've got at the moment. We've kind of got to start somewhere. And the statistical analysis I'm doing is is encouraging. I think, you know, we're, we're looking down the right path. Um, and, and I think it, it makes sense to start with these fundamental building blocks of cognition. Um, but I'm really interested in how we can maybe start to develop some more sophisticated tools to, to model and measure performance in the context of knowledge work. And, and I think there's some, there's some great things on the horizon. Absolutely. I mean, I think my interest in nootropics and cognitive enhancers, I mean, I think that's the uh, uh, just, just a, I guess a limitation or a limitation of how we understand how the brain functions as a way to, to show efficacy or show null effects, right? And I think that, mm -hmm. and I agree with you that these seem fairly blunt, but there does seem to be, uh, it, it makes sort of, you know, building block sense that if you have faster inspection time or reaction time, these are building blocks of higher order cognition. So while they're mm -hmm. not necessarily saying, hey, we can necessarily prove that you're going to be able to solve calculus problems faster, or maybe you could just measure that directly. Uh, but there, there does seem to be some effect of some of these interventions on some very primal uh, cognitive uh, uh, measurement tasks. Um, mm. I'm curious, so for the inhibitory uh, uh, function measurements, like what does that look like in terms of like the actual task? Just, to, just so, to break it down for someone to like imagine, okay, like what tasks am I being measured on, on my phone or on a computer screen? So there's a number of different tasks that you can use to measure inhibitory control. And uh, a really classic one is, um, is called a Stroop test or a mm. Stroop task. And, uh, and so, for example, in the Stroop, you will be instructed to, um, you know, to press spacebar, for example, on your computer um, when you see one kind of stimulus, but then um, resist pressing spacebar when you see another kind. Um, and, and a typical one um, you know, is where they will, um, uh, you have to press spacebar when you see a word that is written in blue color. 
Um, but then the word that pops up is red. And so it's the word red written in blue and you yeah. have to inhibit that response. And so you measure um, in, uh, with a street test, typically there'll be three different conditions. There'll be a baseline and then there's what's called a congruent and then an incongruent condition. Um, but that test can take a little bit longer. Actually, one of the tasks that I use uh, and get people to do a couple of times a day over a tracking period is, is a bit simpler. It's called a go, no go task. And so in this particular version, then um, people are presented with this um, kind of grid um, that looks like windows in a house. And they have to um, basically um, shoot one type of alien and, uh, and not shoot another type of alien, uh, depending on their, their color. And it sounds so simple, but again, you know, we are, we are testing these, these building blocks of, of cognition. And, and actually, you know, we've seen some really statistically significant results and, you know, these tests have been used for a long time, but it's still, you know, that question still remains. What does this, how does this translate? And, um, and I think, you know, we, there's a, uh, you know, that we need to push that forward and, and continue to explore that question. Yeah. And that's, you know, in the next study that I'm doing, one of the things that I'm looking at is, um, uh, comparing this with some um, some self-report measures of work performance that have been um, uh, that have been validated quite well, and then some other measures which look at, for example, our ability to switch off from work because you know, there's some it's very plausible that you know that mechanism around inhibitory control might be associated with that, and uh, there's already some evidence to to suggest that link. So, so yeah, there's um, there's some there's some interesting avenues that we can delve into. Yeah, and I think that in, in sports science, I mean, I think just you know, we've actually looked at, you know, things I think that actually sound quite similar to your inhibitory control uh, markers for sports performance in terms of conflicting information, making a high risk decision, right? Like mm. you could do like a rugby run and you'd go left or right and you have conflicting information to turn left or right. And that's something that we've been looking at with our research partners with, you know, nootropics or ketone esters as an intervention. Mm. So perhaps while it's harder to extrapolate towards like software engineering, ability from an inhibitory control <laughs> task, but from a sports performance perspective, when you are making, you know, go left or go right decisions mm. or go or no go, um, that to me is a lot, a lot more of a direct uh, uh, jump from inhibitory control task to uh, left or right uh, turn decision on, on, a, on a rugby field or a soccer field. And then perhaps mm. from there, we can start, you know, building it more and more block, uh, building blocks towards something like, you know, creative work in terms of making an advertising campaign or, mm. uh, you know, coding an extra line of code. Um, how about working memory? I mean, I think obviously working memory seems to be another obvious or a task where like, if you can, if your digit span uh, memory increases, yeah. that seems pretty uh, fundamental. Um, <clears throat> but I guess on, on the on, on the con side, people, you know, have argued that uh, that kind of working memory is only specific for that kind of task. Or mm -hmm. like, a, like a chess master, they can hold, you know, a thousand I don't know, some really, really high number of board positions in their head. But when they do like a, a completely different uh, memory task, their memory, uh, working memory capacity is similar to like an, another average human. Um, mm. What are your thoughts on some of the working memory capacity, uh, you know, uh, I guess, questions? I think working memory is a, is a fascinating area. And, you know, there's... Um, Actually, there's some recent evidence emerging that's kind of challenged um, some of the the ideas we've got about the, the limits of working memory. I mean, we always used to say, oh, it's between four and seven items, but you know, there's, some, there's some challenges to that now. And uh, But in working memory, people have been exploring this for a long, long time. And I think one of the most famous tests um, of, um, uh, of working memory that many of you will have heard, heard of is called the NBAC task. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's, it's continuous, um, it tests continuous performance. And uh, I think it was developed like, you know, back in the, back in the fifties. But I, I agree that I think you know, working memory, um, it, it clearly has a, a very clear role in our day-to-day -day life and, and work. And we could see how, if we can improve working memory, then, um, it's likely that we could see some benefits in, in our life. I mean, you made another interesting point then again about the transfer. And I think you know, one of the challenges of like, for example, many of the games and many of the, um, uh, the kind of, the uh, uh, the the techniques and courses to try and improve cognitive performance, especially ones that are based on smartphones. When people have investigated them, it's basically demonstrated that it makes you better at the game, right. uh, but not necessarily anything else. I think there was quite an interesting study recently that looked at um, uh, uh, teaching kids chess 
And uh, uh, you know, they found that you know, absolutely, if you teach a kid chess uh, to play chess, then then they get better. At, They'll get better at chess. <laughs> better at playing chess. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean they can take over the world. And you know, and I think that um, it's uh, again, you know, this is this is this is an issue. But and one of the things that I see kind of in in the data and the literature, but certainly in, um, in in my research as well, is that that basically um, uh, once we start to get impaired. Uh, whether that's through inadequate sleep or too much stress or, or whatever, um, or we just simply get tired uh, and fatigued or bored, it actually seems to be those more complex cognitive capabilities that start to uh, where we start to diminish performance first. Mm. And so, you know, I see in my data the most significant effects generally in a in a knowledge work population with those um, those more complex cognitive tasks representing slightly more sophisticated cognitive abilities. And and so working memory is a good example of um, you know of a task which is generally it is a bit more complex and it is it is a bit more demanding. I've got this wonderful test of um, uh, that basically it, it's like probably one of the most comprehensive cognitive tests called the RVIP test, and it's got some similarities with cycle and motor vigilance, but basically it stands for rapid visual information processing. Uh, it lasts for kind of about eight minutes, and and basically you're presented with a, a continuous stream of numbers on the screen. And you have to tap space whenever you see um, a sequence of three even or three odd numbers. And it sounds really simple, but because it's completely continuous and it switches between um, uh, you know, even and then odd and then even, you're constantly having to switch between trying to pay attention to whether you're looking for another even number or another odd number. And, mm. you know, and it, it basically takes people to the limit. And you know, we see with that test some significant differences. But the problem with that, again, is that it's a really horrible thing to do um, once, never mind getting someone to do it every day. Hmm. So we're always trying to kind of balance with cognitive assessment. You know, what will the, the participant tolerate uh, in terms of burden and time and the commitment and, uh, and what will give us the best data? And, and it's always, you know, it's always a bit of a trade off. And, you know, we always used to look at a lot of people in research used to look at simple reaction time, for example. But one of the problems with simple reaction time is that in some conditions, like in some conditions of sleep deprivation, for example, we actually see um, improvements in simple reaction time. Why? Just less inhibition? That would be my hypothesis. Yeah. Um, but what you often find is that it seems to be like, you know, the um, research is kind of a bit because i saw this as well in some of my participants that actually in simple reaction time <laughs> performance improved and when i you can't believe it when i saw you know i was scanning through the data uh, i'm doing some like um if anyone wants to get really geeky into this i'm using some linear mixed effects models and so you know i'm testing kind of the model with this um, uh, i'm looking at um, sleep duration versus cognitive performance in these different tasks and, and suddenly i see this significant relationship pops up between um you know uh, simple reaction time and sleep duration and i'm all excited but then i plot it I see it goes the wrong way. People are getting faster when yeah. sleep is inadequate. I'm like, crap, you know, this is like, <laughs> this is not what I want to see, but you've got to report it. And, um, but anyway, a few researchers have seen this and maybe it's due to, as you say, um, reduced inhibition. There was actually a paper published uh, just a few days ago in Frontiers in Physiology. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, they, they did a, an experiment where um, in the, the Finnish army, they restricted sleep in this poor group of participants for 60 hours. 60 and um and, and they uh, during that time they looked at the effects on uh, physical performance and also cognitive performance yeah. and and sure enough you know they found in the cognitive performance and um, that actually in uh, some of their simple reaction time uh, actually improved um but then overall you know it's a bad thing yeah that's Go funny read the paper for yourself but you don't want to be awake for 60 hours i think that's the bottom line but they might shoot the wrong person Exactly, they might shoot their friend. Uh, and, and you know, in all seriousness, the cognitive test battery that I use um, twice daily in the knowledge work population was originally developed um, and deployed with the US military. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the, the reasons it's this kind of alien go-no-go -no -go task um, about shooting friends and not foes. Uh, sorry, the other way around. Maybe I'm sleep deprived, shooting foes and not friends. Right. Is, um, is because there's a real world consequence of that. And back to your point, you know, in, in a sports context, athletic context, in a, uh, a, a military context, that link between these fundamental cognitive capabilities and a real world impact is, is, is more clear. I think simple reaction time is like an interesting marker. Uh, and I think there's an interesting, I, I think there's an interesting relationship around inhibition control there. We recently had a professional gamer who's oh, been on, on the program noted, um, who's been measuring and optimizing his simple reaction time speed. And I think he tested himself down to like 60 or 80 milliseconds, uh, yeah. which is cool. 
like, you know, I think the average baseball player is like around 100, one, you know, or 120. So like definitely he was seeing that he was able to optimize himself through a battery of like nootropics and all, all, all these kind of kind of crazy interventions, obviously an N equals one. Um, have you looked at different interventions? I mean, mm. uh, or, or, or is your work more focused on the framework of measuring uh, cognition? And if you so, look at interventions, what do you think are the most more promising interventions that you've seen or, or that you play around with personally, whether they're nootropics or different meditation, mindfulness exercises before a task, um, mm. diets, ketones? Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, caffeine, not caffeine, right? Like there's just a lot of things that like, I think people are already experimenting, especially in our community with nootropics or things that can alter some of these things. In terms of the focus of my research um, uh, and particularly around my, my PhD, I'm, I'm really quite um, focused around uh, measurement. And But one of the reasons I'm really interested in measurement is because I want to create a useful toolkit so we can test interventions. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I'm pretty agnostic in terms of interventions, uh, in terms of my, my, my research work. Um, but um, in um, in my, my professional work, you know, I work uh, in knowledge work with various different organisations. But I also work in sport, and um, uh, and the company that I work with, Hints of Performance, um, works particularly in motorsport. And mm -hmm. so we work across a number of different series, including Formula One, Formula Two, Formula Three, uh, GP3, um, uh, and uh, and so. Um, our coaches and, and that team, you know, they're they're working with measurement, but also obviously trying to optimise race performance of these drivers. And and simple reaction time is a significant component of that. Yep. Um, and so, I mean, the, the most potent performance enhancer, adequate sleep. Um, now, actually, in a Formula One driver, that can be quite difficult um, uh, to to maintain because they're travelling so much. So, yep. some of our interventions are actually based around mitigating the effects of jet lag. Um, and looking at how you can reduce circadian disruption by um, uh, basically starting to uh, move into that time zone in advance of travel, mm. uh, selective use of melatonin at particular times, uh, but also caffeine. And, you know, I think you know, caffeine is probably like one of the, the best molecules uh, in the world. You know, it's so potent. And, you know, there's some, you know, that sometimes I wonder if caffeine was suddenly was just synthesized like today. Um, would it be legal? Like, would it be controlled? I think it would definitely would be. I think I think you can make an argument for sugar as well. Yeah, these potent molecules and and caffeine, um, you know, uh, chemically is is in the same group as uh, as a number of different um, uh, uh, molecules, which um, you know you get arrested if you if you if you're using them or carrying them around. And so one of the things interesting things that we see is that in some of the um, people that we worked with is that you can um, you can basically get people to do some of these more um, uh, basic cognitive tests and, uh, and determine the optimal caffeine dose, yeah. uh, both in terms of dosage and, and timing. And it does seem that there is an optimal dose. You can actually start to see um, deficits or, or uh, declines in performance when you take too much. There's actually a big uh, U.S. Army research that uh, published like mm -hmm. the optimal dose. I don't know if you've seen that paper, but it's like they, they've looked at optimal dosing for the war fighting. That's very interesting. I've not come across that paper. I'd be interested to read that. Yeah, it was interesting because I think there's some critique around why did you guys spend millions of dollars on, on, on telling people how to use caffeine? And it's like, well, I guess... Yeah, people kind of well understood caffeine, but yeah, I think at that level, you want to you know finally tune exactly how much you want to dose according to body weight and the length of exercise and all these, all these you know, bespoke variables. Hey, listeners, Dr. Brianna Stubbs jumping in here. You may remember Jeff hinting at a special HVMN ketone deal in the intro. Well, it's time to listen up. Until the end of the month, we are offering $50 off a 12-pack of HVMN ketone. All you have to do is type in the URL www.hvmn.com forward slash pod and you're eligible for that offer. Again, that is www.hvmn.com forward slash pod. The link will also be in the show notes. This offer is running until the end of November 2018, everyone. So act fast and fuel up. Sounds like sleep, caffeine, uh obvious uh you know things that that work anything else in terms of things that are that are on more on the cusp or th things that you're exploring one of the challenges when you're working in an athletic context is is obviously that um you um uh, these athletes are part of uh world anti-doping agency testing pools yep. and so um you've got to make sure that like whatever um they're taking that is it's the athlete's responsibility ultimately but also you know, the coach 
um, uh, you know, co- our coaches are, are very conservative, rightly so, yeah. um, and about kind of what uh, what they're recommending and and what um, what people are what people are taking, and um, and actually, you know, I think even for top athletes and, and top drivers. Um, you know, there um, actually it is still about getting the basics right. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, on, on a personal level, and with some people, I know that they are um, uh, there are some people experimenting with some some new tropics, uh, not kind of uh, uh, necessarily um, you know clients, and that's not something that kind of at a company level we'd we'd recommend. But right. for some people, are interested in it, and they're interested, you know, particularly in saying, look, I'm going to do this regardless um but can you help me kind of measure the impact and and certainly you know i'm interested uh, to see that but but i've got to say like it doesn't seem like many things work very well um uh, even even n equals one and you know i think that like the the with a lot of these things like the most powerful kind of impact kind of is is often is often placebo um yeah. uh but but that said, you know I think that the, the demand is huge. Uh, they published a study in Nature last year about the use of um, stimulants for the purposes of cognitive performance enhancement based on an anonymous survey. And in all the regions that they looked at, um, uh, uh, the um, self-reported use of stimulants, both prescription and kind of uh, off-label and illegal, um, had increased, uh, particularly in in Europe. And so there's this really interesting thing where you know I think that actually you know. Personally, you know, I'm very, I'm very interested in this area, and um, and I'm pro getting the basics right, but also I think that you know it's it, it's it's important that we also explore how you know, some of these molecules might be able to help us. You know, I'm thinking in terms of um, uh, you know, obviously there's a performance enhancement in the workplace, but you know, there's people in kind of really critical roles where, again, like I said, you you can't always control your sleep. Yeah, and one of the things I often talk about is it's a little bit of a tangent, but I encourage people to think about life more in seasons. Um, I, you know, I certainly try and apply this to myself because one of the challenges of the, uh, the current way that we live and work is that we just try and be on all the time. Whereas actually for most of human history, we've lived in this very seasonal way, you know, where there's been times of war, there's been times of peace, there've been times of feast, there's been times of famine. famine and yeah. We're very well set up, you know, our genetic load has prepared us for that kind of, uh, that kind of lifestyle. But we always try and be on, and, and I think one of the problems with kind of um, you know, so-called smart drugs is that sometimes it's just masking kind of um, actually some deeper problems about how we live and work. But actually, you know, I'd like to think that we could look forward to a time where you know, we could have these genuine periods of recharging, uh, where we we look to trying to recover the most natural and the best way possible. We maybe try to tweak a few things in normal time. Uh, but actually, you know, when we were in these kind of mission periods, you know, whether you're a management consultant trying to finish kind of a really important project for a client, you know, whether you're a kind of a warfighter in a in a combat situation, whether you're a, a medic, you know, who's who's dealing with a crisis and has had to pull a double shift just because they need you to help. You know, if I was getting treated by a doctor in a crisis situation. And, uh, and, you know, and she'd had to pull a double shift because, you know, that was what was, that's what it took with all the, the all the people who needed help. Um, and, and she wasn't able to sleep, but if she was able to take a proven product to improve her cognitive performance, you know, I'd much prefer the doctor in that context who had taken the proven you know, safe product that could improve their cognitive performance to help me right. rather than the doctor who, who hadn't. So, so I think, you know, it's, it's another one of these situations where, you know, I think that we need to. Um, it's very easy to kind of um, take an extreme position and kind of say, well, you know, we should do it all natural or kind of go the other way and say, you know, the future is kind of biohacking everything and uh, becoming kind of you know, transhuman. Um, when actually I think that, you know, the reality, I think that the challenge is, is how do we kind of navigate um, and try and take the best from these different approaches and and take a more kind of thoughtful, seasonal approach to life and work that's more sustainable that actually helps us to try and take some of the benefits from these different approaches and and also maybe mitigate some of the potential downsides as well. Well said. That's something that I've been thinking a lot about actually personally around the notion of periodization or cycling. Uh, you know, the cyclical nature of dieting or, 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 or training blocks. And again, I think this is something that's very common in professional sport where you have mm-hmm. training blocks of hard sessions, light sessions, recovery sessions, uh, you know, maximal sessions. Um, and I think that, you know, with some of our uh, athlete and military customers, they're trying to apply that for nutrition as well. And I can imagine that, um, very much in line with what you're saying. I think, um, why aren't 
you know, knowledge workers also applying some of these notions around cycling or periodizing workload, creative load, uh, recovery load. Um, mm-hmm. So, and I think that that uh, I sense as something that will be more and more uh, common and popularized within uh, the biohacking community. Um, mm-hmm. And it's something that like, I think people already start, you know, cycling on and off, you know, different interventions just to, mm-hmm. uh, and, 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 so I, I think, and I think for like a ketogenic diet, that's what I do personally. I think it's just um, more sustainable, uh, and I think the data on on at least in in, in, uh, in for some of the longevity data on animals, uh, cyclical ketogenic diet was just as effective for like just like you know at, at you know at infinitum <laughs> ketogenic diet for longevity markers. So. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's going to be just a lot of more research in the area of just how do you periodize and optimize some of these interventions. I think it's a sensible approach. And I think that how do you find that balance? One one thing that I thought was interesting was uh, the Formula One racing, where I think in compared to a lot of other sports, it's very, I would say, more similar to uh, an intellectual chess match almost over... Um, you know, like a sports, like a, like a physical attribute sport, right? Cause you're just making decisions. You're, you're doing, it's quite physically demanding, but it's more mm-hmm. of like a endurance and like, I guess like a, an ability to not get freaked out cause you're moving so quickly, but you're making like mm-hmm. just split second decisions all the time, as opposed to necessarily having to like lift a lot of weights or sprint really fast. Mm-hmm. Um, what in your experience, uh, is the difference between an elite Formula One driver versus, you know, someone like myself who I'm like, a, I don't even drive anymore because I live in San Francisco and everyone takes Ubers <laughs> and Lyfts, but, uh, but like an average person, right? Who, who isn't able to make that split second decision. One of the incredible um, characteristics of, of top drivers of, of, uh, of the best Formula One drivers, in my opinion, uh, is their consistency. So if you look at kind of, you know, the average uh, you know, Formula One race and, and, and the duration, um, and, uh, and, you know, for a couple of hours, basically, um, you know, they are, they're driving um, at the limit of that, that mechanical system um, you know, with millimeter precision again and again and again for hundreds of laps in an environment that you know in some ways is quite well controlled but in other but you know you're not there on that track on your own um you know, you're on that circuit with 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 m- multiple other drivers right. and um but yet they're still able to to produce this this consistency and um and to to hit exactly the point that they need to um, all at these incredible speeds and um, and they're processing huge amounts of, of data you, know, you talk about working memory again you know, the number of items that they're, they're holding yeah. and and it's interesting i um uh, i've actually gathered some um some cognitive performance data on on some formula one drivers and actually drivers in some other series and and there are actually measurable differences you do see um that in terms of normal distribution you know they are kind of um uh, uh, there are definitely outliers and i i gathered quite a large uh, um, uh, body of data it's large for the kind of population that i looked at where i basically um, i was in uh, davos in uh, at the world economic forum and um outside of that uh, that event kind of in the town we kind of set up a, a testing station mm-hmm. and uh, tested kind of ceos and all kinds of interesting people um, but then also um, uh, measured uh, um, uh, a Formula One driver and uh, and then also um, uh, an F-16 pilot and, and some other people. And basically, it's, uh, I don't know, I don't think we'll be able to publish it just because the conditions weren't super well controlled. Um, but um, I'm kind of gathering this this personal kind of interesting data set. Um, and um, and so, um, but when I looked at that data, you know, um, they they do perform exceptionally well, particularly in terms of sustained attention. You know, they are able to sustain their attention um, uh, better than someone in a, a, the normal population. But when I did this little experiment, I basically I got people to do um, do it both in a, a controlled condition, um, in a in a quiet condition, and then also in a distracted condition. And one of the things that we saw in the drivers as well is that they seem to be more resistant to distraction. Um, you know, when a task is in, uh, is is put in front of them. Um, you know, they are better able to focus on that task and uh, and ignore the irrelevant stimuli. Um, but the, the the other kind of funny thing, um, just uh, kind of anecdotally that I've seen, kind of in working with these drivers, both in Formula One, um, Formula Two, and Formula Three, is in that test that I mentioned before, that kind of eight minute rapid visual information processing uh, kind of uh, marathon. 
the majority of people who do that test, you know, when they finish it, um, they um, they never want to do it again. You know, you, you, I sometimes I kind of worry that people are going to start crying in it. You know, is that is that bad? Um, and I'm sure some of your your listeners will probably um, yeah. you know, leap at the chance to take part, but most people don't like it. But almost um, you know, to a person, the um, the Formula One drivers and the the drivers in those top series, when they finish that the first time, their immediate response is, "Can I try it again? Because I want to do better. Yeah. How can I improve?" Yeah. And and I think you know, there's these very specific skills we can measure. Some things that are very special about Formula One drivers and drivers in these top series, but. But I think you know there is that kind of um, uh, you know that that great sustained attention, the precision, the consistency. But but a lot of it, I think, comes down to this kind of just this deep drive to improve, yeah. uh, this pursuit of excellence. Um, which you know, when we if you look at the footage in a Formula One car and you see the speed um, that that um, uh, that the you know, the the circuit and that the barriers are going past you, and and how fast the corners are coming up to you. And and you think about the precision with which they need to to actually create a lot of force in braking to make sure they brake at the right time in the right way, and and it's completely overwhelming. But but these these people have have been driven to do this from such a young age, and it's been this kind of incremental improvement season after season after season where the cars have got gradually faster, where the braking points have got uh, have got later and have got harder, and um, you know where the mechanical grip has improved and and you know and so. They have grad. They've gone on this journey over time that has equipped them to do that, which has been driven by this this desire to improve and and to optimize. And and as you said, you know, that I think Formula One in particular, it is a really interesting metaphor. And um, and and in some ways, it's a kind of microcosm. And we, we sometimes call it a laboratory for how do you optimize human performance? You know, particularly where you're blending the physical and the cognitive. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so yeah, we're you know at Hintzer, you know, we've been very privileged to work in that environment for um, you know for about twenty years now, and we've got a great team of coaches there and uh, and a great uh, team supporting them, doing some really interesting work. One thing that struck me as you're explaining some of the work you do there is that around sustained attention is that do you have some suspicion around the population change over like this generation where we're constantly being interrupted with with smartphones and and just in deluge of data versus you know previous generations and you know I, just my suspicion is that i just know for me personally when i was you know 12 i didn't have a smartphone i just knew that my ability to sustain attention was much better where i could just get obsessed mm-hmm. with like building a lego set for like seven hours straight or like taking apart a wash or, or, or something and now it's just like hard not to get your know, ping and, and get distracted um do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, is there a yeah. suspicion that like there's a population level decrease in the ability <laughs> of people to sustain attention now? Because it is kind of funny that you mentioned, oh, eight minutes of just like looking at numbers and people are like crying. It's like, like hardly that's torture, right? Like mm. that, but, but I understand what, you know, you're You've like, never look, tried it, Jeffrey. You've got to, you've got to give it a go. <laughs> I, I've, I've done some of these tasks myself. I, I, I think I'm more on the side of like, I can, I think my ability to sustain attention is like reasonable. Um, mm. So I think I'm cut more in that pull. But do you suspect that just our, just like our generation is less able to sustain attention just be, because of the environment? I am concerned. My wife and I've got two kids. Um, they're two boys, four and, and seven years old. And, um, and you know, it's uh, so many parents talk about this and people you know, who just know kids, friends have got kids, relatives have got kids, and you, know, you just see how adept they are uh, yeah. navigating their way around an iPad, for example. Right. Um, you know, they just figure out your password just by watching you and, and you know, they can, um, before you know it, they're on Netflix and, and watching hopefully something appropriate. Um, right. uh, and, uh, but, you know, I think that um, I'm not, uh, I'm very pro-technology, what a surprise. And I actually think that you know these um, uh, these systems that we've got are incredibly powerful tools, but they're terrible masters. I think one of the risks that we've one of the traps we've fallen into is that we've um, conflated uh, familiarity with expertise. Hmm. And so you know I can watch like my kids um, navigate their way through an iPad, and everyone's like, oh, you know they're they're experts. Well, they're not. They're not. They're just very familiar. And um, and so you know actually I think there's a really powerful um, kind of analogy. In um, in language and the acquisition of language, 
because you know we accept that um, you know language you know is a, is a powerful tool. We can look at it like a tool. It's arguably one of the most powerful tools that that humanity has um, has ever had access to. Mm-hmm. And and we look at language and how we acquire language, and we we accept that a lot of language acquisition comes through exposure. You know, if, um, so we live in France, but we're originally from the UK, and, and you know, and our kids have learned most of their French through simple exposure. My wife and I are both English, and so they picked it up at school with friends. But you know, they're both pretty much fluent now. But at the same time, they also learn a structure around language. So they're in French school, and they're learning the grammar, and they're learning how to construct sentences, and their their vocabulary is expanding in a more structured way, so that they can actually become masters of uh, of this language eventually. But with technology, it's so new in terms of you know the span of human history that like we like to think that we're experts, but really I think we're basically just like toddlers trying to figure this stuff out. And um, and so you know that the I think the challenge is how do we kind of find the right balance between learning through exposure and also what do we need to really achieve mastery over these tools so that we're not slaves to it. And I think you know this this is the kind of the, the bigger picture that I think you know the meta narrative I think about when uh, when I'm considering you know, what does it mean for sustained attention and distraction, for example. You know I think that you know uh, you, you ask a good question: Is sustained attention worse now? in young people than it used to be. I think one of the challenges is we don't have a particularly great data set to compare it with. All we've got is anecdote. Um, and But, you know, anecdotally, we've got a number of friends who are teachers and they say you know, that our friends who've been teachers for, for decades would say that, well, kids now can't pay, his attention, uh, pay attention as well as they used to. And I think, you know, the, the interesting thing is the technologies to distract us have um, have accelerated in terms of their maturity and sophistication much faster than our capacity to really understand what's going on. Yeah. But you know, back back in um, end of 2013, something like that, I think it was. Um, you know, I read a book uh, by um, uh, um, uh, Nur Eyal. I think I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but basically, he wrote a book called Hooked about how to build habit forming products. Yeah. So what's that? It's getting on for five years ago. And he had this great this great model around how to build a habit forming product. And I remember I kind of read this and I was like, this is, this is great. You know, there's the, um, there's the trigger, there's the action, um, there's the variable reward, there's the investment. Yeah, this is a gamification. This is how you get addicted. This is Silicon Valley, sort of why yeah. they're getting critiqued in, in recent months. They're just like yeah. mentally addicting you to that dopamine hit of like a notification. And everyone's like, oh, you know, it's like, <laughs> this is news. You know, yeah. Yeah, like people have been talking about this for ages. Yeah. And, and you know we we're basically creating these systems to kind of um, uh, take advantage of our you know our dopaminergic system. Yeah. You, you know we're, we're we're kind of dumping dopamine and and we wonder why. I mean I think the challenge is is that um, you know we basically if you look at the biases that we have, um, many of those cognitive biases have been adapted for most of human history. And so if you if we just zoom in on the the novelty bias that we have, for example. So we know that actually there's research that demonstrates that even in the anticipation of um, novelty, so even just anticipating discovering or being exposed to something new, our brain secretes dopamine. Mm -hmm. And so we sense that reward. And so if you think for most of human history, that has been incredibly adaptive. Because if I was living in a village society and I was kind of walking through that village and I looked up at the mountains and I've never been to the other side of that mountain range before. But in anticipation of discovering something new on the other side of that mountain range, my brain secretes dopamine. And that sense of reward and that, that anticipation of that novelty will probably drive me to invest the, the energetic resources and the time to go and explore that other side of the mountain and, and find new opportunities to, to grow and to, to find new resources and, and new people. Um, and so, you know, there's an argument, I think, that suggests that that novelty bias for most of human history may have been responsible for driving, you know, our expansion across the planet. Right. Um, but today, that same incredibly powerful novelty bias is connected with the continuous stream of novelty on my smartphone. Now you're addicted to checking your Twitter feed or Instagram or Facebook feed. And the problem is, is you know, we, and then we just we just feel bad about it. And yeah. so a lot of people are now saying, oh, you know, we've got to kind of resist kind of this stuff. But the problem is as well, we know that in terms of behavior change that, that generally uh, when you rely on uh, on willpower, you generally fail. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like um. So regardless of what you look at, um, at how you look at kind of willpower or self control, if you choose to um, kind of um, uh, interchange the two, 
you know, the interesting thing about kind of self-control and behavior change is that, again, for most of human history, self-control has been uh, appropriately balanced with the choices that we had available. You know, I mentioned before about seasons. We didn't need a strategy to um, uh, to think about our food intake because um, generally times of plentiful food, which were few and far between, would be rapidly followed by a period of famine. Mm-hmm. But so what, at the moment, we've kind of got to this stage where, you know, I think um, we started to beat ourselves up about our technological habits now and feel bad about it. Um, and um, and so, you know, we're going to kind of probably see like, you know, some kind of uh, we, we are seeing these kind of uh, behavior change interventions around trying to address this. But I don't necessarily think it's addressing the root cause of the problem. And there's some quite interesting research that, you know, that sheds a, that sheds a light on on this um, that suggests that kind of rather than than willpower operating like a, a kind of finite resource um, that actually um, self-control operates more like a valuation process you know, rather than it operating like this kind of battle um, and that we can win or lose. And there's actually some quite interesting neuroscience related to this. Um, there was a research called Berkman, um, uh, Berkman and a group last year um, published a paper called Self-Control as a Values-Based Choice. Mm which um, suggests that there's a region of the brain called the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex that might be responsible for calculating the return on investment of the effort required by a task. And so and if you think that we've got this valuation system built in, but for most of human history, you know, that, that valuation system was basically built for a different age. But I wonder whether you know some of these kind of solutions potentially to this distraction and interruption epidemic uh, and the tools that we're using is actually, again, maybe taking advantage of some of that inhibitory control, taking a step back and thinking about what we really value, yeah. what we truly value, rather than kind of being caught in this kind of this kind of fake value that's driven by these kind of, you know, dopaminergic manipulation, <laughs> essentially. I would say that, yeah, you're absolutely right. Only within the last 50, 60 years mm-hmm. are we surrounded in an environment that we're in, in, a, in you know, f- fortunately for you know, compared to like most of human history, uh, environment overabundance, overabundance of food, mm. overabundance of information. And perhaps, you know, that new environment is why we're seeing that one in two Americans is pre-diabetic, one in two Americans mm. obese. And within the last 10 years, I would say that there's an overabundance availability of information where, and I think that's an interesting uh, point where the valuation of return on investment of like a swipe on your smartphone is very, very low investment mm. in a single instance, but there's a variable reward of like what kind of cool information, like, oh, is your friend getting married? Is there you know, a new baby or like they have a new toy? Um, or is it just boring and you feel like you just wasted, you know, 10 minutes of your life? Um, <laughs> um, it, 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 so in your mind, then, you know, do you see this as willpower as a limited resource or scarce resource? Does that mean being more thoughtful the environment we put ourselves into? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think this is an unsolved question, right? Like, I, I don't know if anyone has the solution here or we, you know, and I think we also want to be, you know, thoughtful of not being overly Luddite and be like, hey, all technology is evil. Because I, I agree with you that technology has essentially resolved like the things that have killed most people, which has been famine and then like lack of information or lack of tool ability to access information. Um, but, okay, w- you know, what do you suspect to be interesting paths to explore? We've got to figure out ways to truly master technology. Yeah. And um, we could get really into the weeds here and also kind of way outside my scope of practice. And, yeah. But, you know, one of the things that interests me kind of peripherally um, is um, is this idea of explainable AI, for example. Mm. Um, and and actually, if we look at kind of um, how um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and these associated technologies are developing, um, actually, it seems to me that one path that is absolutely crucial that we explore is uh, is explainable AI. And, um, and actually, you know, there's some quite interesting companies um, looking into this to help us to actually understand these systems uh, and, and truly master them um, so that they don't, they don't master us. Um, but kind of taking it back kind of a, a step and, and, and focusing in on the, the human, which is more, more my area of expertise, you know, there's some interesting research around self-control. And, and one of the kind of uh, things that interests me is that you know, there was some research done by um, uh, Gala and, and Duckworth. Uh, that's Duckworth, Angela Duckworth, who um, uh, kind of wrote quite a lot about, about grit and that idea. But they found, um, they published a paper called um, More Than Resisting Temptation. 
And, and they suggest that, um, according to their research, people with the highest self-control actually seem to use it the least day to day. Hmm. And, and so kind of like, you know, that's to your point that, um, you know, self-control to some extent, I think it does operate like uh, a resource. And um, Roy Baumeister, who um, talks about ego depletion, has got a bit of a hard time because actually some of those experiments have failed to replicate. But, mm. but it, the, it does have some characteristics of a resource. But it also seems to be fundamentally linked with our sense of valuation and our motivation. And we seem to be able to kind of uh, instantly replenish this resource um, in certain conditions. You know, if, if suddenly you can you can kind of hack your motivation um, uh, and, and that system. But it does self-control does seem to be most effective when we deploy it before we need it, and uh, and if we link it with goals, and uh, if we or we create goals that are associated with something that we really value, and and so you know I think that you know one of the paths that we do need to explore in terms of you know, whether it's optimization or, or behaviour change, is is actually accept some of the biases and limitations that we've got and try and find ways to kind of manage them and, and work around them. Because um, I think that you know one of the the most unhelpful things is that you know, we can just fall into this trap of just beating ourselves up and thinking that we're bad people because we because we fail because we you know, and I think it's it's so funny because you know I um you know I, I always need to take my own medicine and I, but I kind of as I'm sure you do you kind of often you you're kind of in this kind of like not exactly I'm not in a biohacker community necessarily but you know surrounded by people who are really interested in optimizing themselves and, and other people and and you can fall into this trap of kind of thinking that you know if you haven't woken up in the morning uh, done 20 minutes of meditation um you know of course you fasted breakfast because right. you're doing a kind of uh, intermittent fasting restricted eating <laughs> protocol and but you know once you've done your kind of uh, your squats because you're squatting every day and uh, and written your kind of your, your goals down for the day and and you know taking the dog for a walk and if you've not done all that stuff before like 5 30 a.m then you know why yeah, are you bothering yeah um and you know that, was it mark Wahlberg who kind of published his like a uh, daily routine yeah it's like he wakes up like 3 30 or something i was like what? yeah who is this guy? I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, you know what? Like, maybe, maybe that's true, and like, good for him. But yeah. I think the problem is, is that you know, we we also know with behavior change and goal setting, like one of the biggest um, uh, kind of uh, ways to set yourself up for failure is to set completely unrealistic goals. Right. And so sometimes I just think, you know, maybe the starting point and the path is is to actually just take a step back and and just to say, you know, what do you really care about? Um, what do you really value? And, and build a kind of a, a progressive path to to help you to achieve that, and and try and, and sequence as well. Um, you know, we, not rather than trying to achieve everything all at once, it kind of goes back to and um, you you mentioned periodization, right. and you know, I'm very much inclined to agree that we need to take a more periodized seasonal view of how we approach um, improving life and performance, right? And actually start to say, you know, these are the things I want to achieve, but actually I'm not going to try and do them all at once. You know, right. I'm actually going to create a plan. And I know a lot of people are already starting to think this way, but um, but it can it can it can be quite liberating. Are you applying it to yourself? I know that you know one of the you know topics, and I think we you know we'll, we'll end on you know some of these these ideas is that how do you stack some of like the low uh, cycle cognitive load with medium load, high load? Is that something you apply personally when you you know as you're thinking about these ideas? Have you incorporated for yourself? Do you have you know? I guess uh, frameworks or guidelines for how our listeners can take away from how how should we start thinking about periodizing some of our work mm. in, in intellect intellectual field. So you've teed me up perfectly yeah. for, my, for my kind of topic. So yeah. you know, I, going back to right at the beginning, you know, I mentioned I was um, an endurance athlete, yeah. and so I tend to look at knowledge work as an endurance activity yeah. through that lens. And uh, and so I was looking at how we distribute physical effort. And we plan for physical endurance. And, and the simple way that we do it for athletes is we think about intensity zones. So you, and broadly speaking, there's only three zones you really need to think about. And you can think about it as low, medium, and high. Yeah. But I was kind of thinking, could I come up with some kind of framework like that to help people to create a plan for cognitive endurance? Mm. And so, so basically inspired by that, that kind of simple framework um, for in endurance sport, I came up with something I call cognitive gears. And basically, it's a, it's a plan for cognitive endurance. And so if you imagine for a moment that there are three cognitive gears, there's a low gear, which is characterized by times of rest and recovery and reflection. There's a high cognitive gear that's characterized by times where we're focused, where we're maybe doing some kind of analysis, where we're really being productive. And then there's this middle cognitive gear that's characterized by the menial tasks and the switching work, which makes up at least part of most of our day. 
But if you think for a moment about your average day, the most of us will find that we spend the majority of our day stuck in that cognitive middle gear. And that middle gear is characterized by being caught in pseudo work, you know, pulling our phone out every opportunity instead of having a break, feeling like we're stressed that we're on someone else's schedule. Responding a bunch of emails, just like react, reacting yeah. to inbound. All the time. And, and that we know that switching as well actually makes it harder to switch into that high gear for focus or down into low gear when we really need to. Mm -hmm. you know, there's this thing called attention residue. And so one of the things I encourage people to do is to, is to start off by, by thinking about that framework and then considering when they are at their best. So what parts of their day, because basically you know, cognitive performance varies by about 20% during the average day. And about 20% of the population experience that variation as a peak, a valley and a rebound. Might call them early birds. They feel at their best in the morning. Mm. Some people, about 20% experience it as a rebound, a valley and a peak. And they might call them owls. They generally prefer evenings. About 60% are somewhere in between. But basically those three phases, regardless of where you are, have distinct characteristics. And that peak is generally the best time for that high gear focus, for that analysis and that productivity. That valley is the best time for rest, for recovery and reflection. And that rebound is the best time for the menial tasks and the switching work that characterize at least part of our day. And actually in that rebound period, interestingly, it actually seems like our inhibitory control is reduced. Hmm. So we're more likely to switch anyway. But interestingly, that reduced inhibition actually might make us more creative or more open to having creative ideas, which we can then hopefully produce in the peak period, which kind of eventually comes around. But I kind of think you know, if we start by maybe thinking about those three cognitive gears, we could begin by simply doing an experiment where we try to schedule that high cognitive gear work with the peak in our day. And that's that principle from endurance sport, knowing where to focus your effort. And during that time, experiment maybe with you know, the Pomodoro, Pomodoro technique or something like that, 25 minutes on, five minutes off. And that's quite an interesting experiment for a lot of people because yeah. you know, some data would suggest that we check in on our communication tools once every six minutes. So Rescue Time, which is an app that you can, or um, a piece of software you can install to track um, kind of your, um, uh, your use of various applications, Basically, um, that, their data from tens of thousands of people suggests that we check in on communication tools like Slack or whatever once every six minutes. Yeah. So high gear, 25 minutes on, five minutes off. And then I think as an individual, we need to try and engineer environments for focus for ourselves. But I think perhaps more importantly, if we are leaders with teams, how can we engineer environments for focus for our teams? So that's high gear. For the, for the low gear about when to take a rest, well, for a lot of us, that could begin by simply schedule and rest in our diary. Most of us never, ever do that. You know, we don't put recovery. Right. And if you can, schedule that rest and reflection with the valley in your day. And then during that time, you know, the most effective breaks, according to the evidence, seem to be active, social, and natural. So mm -hmm. go for a walk in the park, something that you like. You know, once upon a time, I think it was called a lunch break before it went extinct, um, <laughs> kind of on, certainly on the the West Coast and in London. Or a smoke break or a, a <laughs> yeah, mid exactly. a lunch martini or something. <laughs> there were some good things about that. Yeah. That, you know, we can talk about that, but you know, there's, um, we've lost it. And then obviously sleep is the big one. But then that middle gear, you know, I think for that middle gear, that starts by, by setting some boundaries for the switching tasks so it doesn't leak into every moment. You know, having those periods where we put the phone away. But then you know, when we are going to be doing those switching tasks and using these incredible digital tools that enable us to switch tasks rapidly and get through all that inbound, well, you know, schedule that for the rebound in your day. You know, if you're an owl, that's probably going to be in the morning. If you're an early bird, then it's probably going to be later in the day. Um, but whatever you do, one of the most important things that I say in thinking about these cognitive gears and the periodization um, is that I think one of the most practical strategies or the most practical tactics is to start the day on your schedule. So pay attention to when you're at your best and start that day with your schedule. If you're an early bird, really create some time for that peak, for that peak work. If you're you know, an owl, maybe the morning is, is the time for you to get through the email and the inbound. But whatever the case, let's try and move beyond this kind of um, post-industrial idea of like, working like we're on a production line right. um, in front of our laptops and, and start to rediscover our own rhythm. Well said. I mean, I, I, I want to ask, like, have you been able to successfully apply this to your own working routine? You know what? I reckon most of the time, 
but it goes in seasons still. <laughs> okay. And, you know, I think that the challenge is, is, you know, that again, I think I'm in what I'd call a mission at the moment. You know, I, I try to think about like in three seasons. I mentioned before, there's recharge time. And during that recharge time, you know, um, then I'm really disciplined about, um, like trying to follow these principles, try to put my phone away, make sure I sleep adequately. Right. During what I call normal time, I reckon I managed to follow this 80% of the time. Nice. So if I'm in a routine, you know, like that, but, um, but that 80%, um, you know, sometimes is loaded uh, at a particular time of the year. And, you know, at the moment in the last four weeks, I've done 14 flights. Um, I'm about to, set to start a new research project and I'm finishing setting that up. Um, I'm also kind sure. of working on a number yeah. of different projects and I'm right in it. And you know what? It's gone completely out the window. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I'm clinging on to is like seven hours of sleep a night. Um, everything else is like, uh, in the toilet. <laughs> and, um, but I think like the, again, you know, I think one of the things I often say to myself and other people is, um, progress isn't linear and don't make perfection the enemy of good enough. I know that I'm not kind of practicing what I preach in all aspects right now, but I'll get back on it. Yeah. And that's fine. That's life. Yeah. You know, uh, no one's perfect. And um, I think uh, we've got to keep the end goal in mind um, and sometimes you know, cut ourselves a bit of slack yeah. and uh, and just um, uh, trust the process. And I think we'll get there in the end. Uh, this is a fascinating discussion. I mean, a lot of topics that you've been looking at are very dear to my heart. So it's it a fun conversation. So how do people follow your work? How do people learn more about what you do with Hinsa? All of that. What, you know, what do you got for the rest of the year in 2019 that you're excited about? On a personal level, uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is my next research project where I'm going to be looking at some cognitive measures and combining some heart rate variability stuff mm -hmm. and, and looking into that. That's, that's going to be exciting. Um, I'm going to be um, traveling around still. Kind of, uh, um, I'm speaking at events for a number of clients. Um, I haven't got anything kind of particularly big and, and public going on, but um, if anyone would like to invite me to an event, I'm, I'm always open to, uh, to potential opportunities there. But, um, but if people want to follow kind of my writing and my work and some of the preliminary results when, when I can share them, then um, uh, I work with a company called Hintsa Performance, and we have a website there. Um, it's H-I-N-T-S-A dot com. And uh, you can check out the blog. I've also got a personal website where that's more kind of orientated towards kind of my obsessions and uh, some of this uh, uh, looking at sustainable high performance and knowledge work and cognitive performance as an endurance activity. And uh, my website is jameshewitt.net. It's H-E-W-I-T-T. -T. And then, of course, uh, on Twitter, uh, James P. Hewitt. And uh, on any of those channels, you know, please feel free to get in touch and ask you questions, share comments. And you know, I've, I've learned an incredible amount from the audiences I connect with. And um, there's always something new to find out. So it would be great to hear from some, from some people. All right. Pleasure. Thanks so much, James. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in this week, everyone. As always, please send my producer Zill and I any feedback or topic or guest suggestions to podcast at hvmn.com. We read every single message and work really hard to make this program valuable and educational for you. Also, don't forget our ongoing special offer. By leaving a review on iTunes, you can get a one month supply of our new Omega-3 product, Kato. Simply rate us with a written review on iTunes, screenshot it and send it out to our email hotline. Again, that email is podcast at hvmn.com. Appreciate the love and support and I'll see you again next week.